Welcome to Pathway Community Church Online. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us for church today. My name is Erin, and I'm just gonna go over a few quick announcements with you. I wanna let you know about something that Pathway has going on every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on our YouTube channel. It's called Late Night with Pathway, and it's a great way to connect, have a conversation as a church family. There's all kinds of interesting topics being discussed, and we invite you to join us. Lastly, I want to let you know about our upcoming AGM. That stands for our Annual General Meeting. And this is a place where we get to discuss what's going on in the church. If you're a member at Pathway, you should have received an email. If you haven't received that email with the info packet, just let us know and we'll make sure you get all the information that you need. Again, that's March 16th. Make sure to join us for that. And now, let's spend some time in worship.
of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you So there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are and fill me with
Today, we will be taking in the last conversation in the series, The Gospel as it Relates to. We've been looking at different relationships and how the gospel influences those relationships. So today, we're gonna to be looking at parenting. So we've got a couple of couples, I guess, from our church that will be looking and discussing exactly this topic. Let's listen to what they have to say. All right, here we are. Here we are. Start us off. Well, I am Randy Fraze, and this is my wife, Shelly. We've been married for what we just discussed was <laughs> 13 years, going on 14 this summer. We're sitting here with... Bob and Heather. Dirksen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've been married, will be 31 years this summer. We got two girls, and uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. What is your favorite thing about being a parent? <laughs> being empty nesters. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> kinda, <laughs> kinda. <laughs> no, no, no. We got, we got to read up on this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just watching them excel. I mean, I think that's the that's my favorite part is watching them do something well and knowing that maybe you had a small part in molding <laughs> them into that, right? And uh, yeah. I remember the first time they got a job. And to watch them, you know, from the background, you could watch them working at their job and to see actually they were working, they were contributing and they were, I thought, oh, you know, that's awesome. That, that made me proud, right? And, right. Yeah. I love spending time with them. I mean, they humor me and, and spend time with me, whether they like it or not. But I, I, love, I love spending time with them and, and hanging out and just being with them. Yeah. I think... I'm kind of on the same lines as you. I, I have dad proud moments. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, our kids are graduated or anything like that, but like when they get like a hockey medal or a baseball medal or a gymnastics medal, or they've done something that you, you've had that little part of you that's been able to help them or whatever. And yeah. you just have this moment where you kind of melt, mm -hmm. right? You're like, oh, like you're just so proud. And yeah, I don't know. I, I love spending time with our kids too, but those are things for moments where I'm just like, I, I kind of get like excited, right? You're like, you're, I, you're I still get those moments. I still get those moments where I'm excited and I'm proud when I see what they're doing. So that doesn't stop. Well, that's awesome. And I kind of was looking at this and I was, <laughs> I wasn't, I was looking at this as like, yeah, my favorite thing about my kids is just, yeah, hanging out with them and all the cool memories that we have together and like cuddling with them and reading with them and all those things. But then I was also looking at that question and thinking, okay, well, um, like, are we thinking like favorite thing about the role of being a parent? Um, and then what my head kind of went to is like, well, something that I appreciate about parenthood is, um, I feel like being a parent has made me grow as a person. Um, and that's a little bit more introspective than, but, but as a person, like when I look at, um, you know, when, when you see your kid do something awesome and you're like, oh, I maybe had something to do with that. But then you see something that your kid that does that's like, eh, that's me too. But that's, <laughs> that's not what I would like to see. Right. And so then I find that, um, being a parent has made me grow because I, I'm constantly looking at my, my beliefs and evaluating them. And I'm constantly looking at my behaviors and evaluating them and seeing how that impacts my kids and seeing how uh, that influences them and encourages them or discourages them. And so I think that something, um, it's not necessarily always my favorite part of being a parent, but at the same time, I think it's probably a good thing for my own personal growth to have been a parent and have the opportunity to be a parent because I feel like it's really challenged me to be a better version of myself, I guess, mm -hmm. if that makes mm -hmm. sense at all. Um, that's also, yeah. So it's, I mean, one of my favorite, favorite things in that it's helped me grow, but also one of the most challenging things in that, again, it's, <laughs> that growth usually happens from, from, from seeing things that good when you see the things that you like about yourself but when you see the flaws you're like oh <laughs> that's 
her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. Clearly not me. I, mean. I know. And that's, <laughs> and that's, yeah, so that's how I sort of read that, that question a little bit too. So a little bit different than how Randy had read it, but. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. What do you think the ideal family of faith should look like? I, I don't think the <laughs> ideal family, yeah, after, you know, you read the Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 9, right? When they talk about what the, you know, you're supposed to tie it on the bed frames and, and tie it on the doorposts. And, and, and I read that and I think, okay, well, then I guess we failed, right? Then we didn't, then we didn't do a good enough job. You know, we tried to, we tried to do our best, but when I read that, then I think, hey, we're not the ideal. Then we, the bar is too high. <laughs> when I think of ideal, um, ideal family of faith, I'm thinking um, not just some, not just a family who who fall, does the right the right things, but actually. Um, has a relationship with God, right? Who actually has a personal relationship with their Savior, not just going to church and dressing the right way and saying the right things and having the right relationships, but someone like that, that your, your kids see that you have a, a faith, a personal relationship with Jesus. So, um, and I think that's kind of actually harder than just doing the right things because, um, especially if that's a personal thing to you and, and you're not used to sharing that kind of thing with other people, um, I think that's actually harder than, than just running through the things that you normally do that are the right things to do. Um, well, my grandma, she... Um, was someone who I always really admired her faith. She, as she got old, I don't, I don't even remember her ever going to church. When she was younger, she did go to church, but as she got older, you know, um, it becomes more difficult to mm -hmm. get into the building. And when you're there, you know, there's just some logistical things there. She didn't end up going to church for a really long time. And so she wasn't doing the right things, if you know what I mean. But at the same time, she had an incredible faith. She read her Bible all the time. And when she talked to me, whenever she, in all of her conversations, her faith was mixed in there. And not just like that you should be doing this or this or this, but that Jesus wants us to be, you know, Jesus has these feelings for us. He loves you. Oh, I love you. And Jesus loves you too. And things, you know, and that's not a direct quote, but just that her faith was so strong. Like she spoke of him like, like God as if he was just always with her all the time. <clears throat> it was just so amazing to hear her speak and when she prayed she like she prayed as if he was sitting right there mm -hmm. and just like as like a best friend almost yeah and it was and so then yeah. i when i think about an ideal um family of faith i think of like what my grandma was to me f um like it should be inviting right like for you it was obviously very inviting yeah right like i saw that and i was like well that's like really appealing because because she had that relationship right. with him, not that she was necessarily following the rules exactly the way, right? Yeah, the way that we would perceive mm -hmm. them a good Christian to be exactly doing all of these X, Y, and Z things, but but just that she had that kind of relationship. And uh, again, so I I think that that's <clears throat> I think that is something to aspire to, anyways. What does Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 9 mean to you, and how do you feel it should affect your parenting? Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's a very structured 
um, laid out verse that, you know, like, do this, right? Where, uh, I guess we kind of like, we looked at it as like, we like a relational side yeah. of that. And there's nothing, and I mean, the verse is there and it's pretty like hardcore, right? It tells you what you should be doing. And it's hard to model that, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, to try to create a safe place for your kids to, especially as, as adults, you know, you want to maintain that relationship with them and to, and to allow them to feel the freedom to come to you. And um, does that make sense? I don't know. Let me see what it really is. <laughs> awesome. Like, we're over 50, okay? So, right. you know, the memory is slipping. <clears throat> it's all good. Well, obviously, we're supposed to make it a huge part of our parenting, right? I mean, we're supposed to talk about it when we get up in the morning. We're supposed to talk about it when we go to bed. And in all times in between. And, uh, and yeah, and, and that to a large degree, I think we try to do that. But I, again, when I, when I read that, then I, f I feel that we fell short, right? We didn't impress them on your children. Do, you're like, Ooh, man, I should have tried harder. Yeah, I, <laughs> I can do better. I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think we do do it even, even maybe even without even noticing it. And it, it just becomes the more you, it, it, it becomes part of your conversation with your kids. It becomes natural, right? And right. Of course, yeah. You, you pray before meals and you give thanks and you do different things. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're right. To, to a large degree, I hope that, you know, <laughs> they see things that, that we've done and, and we're, we're modeling those. Uh, yeah. Just like today, even, I mean, my son, we're going to our hockey windup and, he looks out at the sunset. He's like, oh, those are pretty colors. He's like, look at look at the trees and stuff like that. He's like, it's like God painted a picture. And I was like, hmm. and I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's I mean, I'm driving, but I look at the side, I'm like, yeah, that's beautiful, right? But like in everything we do, I mean, God's made everything, right? Like, so really anything we see or anything we do is we can use that as... It's a picture that he It's painted. a picture, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so then that's... To me, this passage is, is uh, the answer to our ideal family of faith, what it should look like, right? Where, where um, our faith is part of every aspect of our day. Mm -hmm. um, to be real about that a little bit, I find that our days end up coming and going so quickly that unless we are super intentional about it... Um, this kind of thing doesn't necessarily happen as much as naturally as I right. feel like it should. Um, this passage sort of gives me a little bit of guilt because I feel like it should be something mm. that should be fairly natural that, that, you know, that just comes pouring out of, you know, your faith comes pouring out of you at every aspect or every, every time of the day. But I, um, but I think he is also <laughs> telling us to try to make it intentional. Right. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we get so busy and our days go by so fast and, but I think this is a reminder for us to make it intentional. Right. And it's easy for us to, I mean, we all do. We're all, we, I'm guilty <laughs> as anything. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, we, we blame it on being too busy mm -hmm. or there's other things that get in the way and, and we probably should be more intentional. Um, what do you <laughs> wish your children knew about your desi your desire for the relationship with Jesus. For me, I mean, my desire for our children is that they can walk along with Christ, right? Like, I, I want to see them get baptized. I want to see them, you know, see how hopefully we've done a good enough job raising them, right? That they they want to follow Christ and that mm -hmm. they want to have Him in <clears throat> in their life, and. I mean, we're not at the stage where our kids are getting married, but you yeah. pray for the people that right. they're that hopefully they'll find one day, and that you know, how I say, like look for somebody that you know that will love Jesus, and, that, and 
respect them and they'll respect you, right? Like look, look for those things. And we may not be perfect examples, but you know, you, you try and be the best you can for them, right? right? And so, but just how their drive is for God, like I, I want all three of my children to accept Christ. Mm-hmm. I want them to... But on their own accord, like yes. meaning like I want it to be their to. faith. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Not that not that they are going to church because I tell them to do mm-hmm. to do that, or not because they're reading their Bible because I'm making them, but because that they they have that desire mm-hmm. for that relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, not to make me happy, not to make Randy happy, not because it's the rules, just that they they they, they want, want that, that relationship. Yeah, for themselves, right. absolutely. For themselves. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series, As It Relates To. Now, we're talking about the gospel and as it relates to various relationships that we have in life. And this is actually our last one. Now, you've seen the conversation that we had already. And if you haven't seen that conversation yet, then the link will be provided for you. And you can check it out a little bit later. Uh, But we got people together talking about what it means to parent with the gospel in mind. And uh, it was just really exciting. And I have to tell you, I've really enjoyed this series. And I trust that you have as well. If you haven't seen any of the others in this series, I invite you to go take a look back at them. And I trust that you'll be blessed by what is going on in those series, or in this series, as it relates to. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to a passage of Scripture that we use a lot. Now, we may not know the reference for it, but we use it an awful lot as it relates to children. So today, I just want you to know that we're talking about as it relates to the gospel, as it relates to parenting. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Now, if you don't know where the book of Psalms is, in the beginning of your Bible, there's a table of contents. People worked really hard to put it there. Don't be ashamed to use it. Psalm 127. And for the reading just for now, I'm going to be focusing on verse 4 and 5. So, Psalm 127. Here's what it says. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Jesus, that as we're uh, looking into this idea of how the gospel should be impacting us as parents, uh, Lord, that those who are parents are going to keen in on this and and learn something and grow into it. And Lord, those who are uh, children, Lord, that they would see the role that the parents are to be playing in their lives as they move forward in faith and life. So, Lord God, as we have our, our ourselves as a people coming together to learn more about how the gospel impacts us, I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be open, our ears would be open, and our hearts would be open to what you have for us today. In your name I pray. Amen. Um, I can remember as a young kid, uh, we used to go camping every year um, when my parents had had purchased one particular camper. And uh, we would go to a place called Miami Beach, Manitoba. And so there was these campsites, but there was also a bit of a forested area. And in this forested area, of course, there were a lot of trees that had fallen and, and that kind of stuff. And being young boys, my brother and I, we, were, we are 14 months apart. And so we would go into the bush and we were like, yeah, let's, let's make forts. And so we'd make a fort and, and they were like, okay, but now we need to protect the fort. And so let's make bows and arrows. And so we would look around for the best kind of branch that we could find that had just enough firmness in it, just enough flex in it, so that when you would tie a string, it would it would be quite taut and very quite tense so that you could fling an arrow. And then we would go around looking for the branches that were the straightest that we could find with the least number of little uh, knots in it and that kind of thing, so that when we peel the bark off, it would shoot straight and accurately. And then we would have to sharpen them. And we'd sharpen them so that they would stick into the mark and stay in that mark that we had desired for it. Man, that was fun. Making bows and arrows as kids and (laughs) doing our best not to shoot each other with them, Uh, you know, because that would make mom a little upset. Um, It was just a really, really good time. And, uh, And I find it interesting that the author of the Psalms, and this is Solomon at this point, would talk about bows and arrows. He would specifically talk about arrows. And 
And what we need to understand about in its day is that archery was, was significant uh, in the military in its day. Uh, a warrior would be able to fire their arrows from a horseback or from a great distance and, and they would sharpen those, those arrowheads in order to be able to have the impact that they wanted it to have. And so it was a really important piece of armory and it was a really important role within the military. And so when the psalmist comes along, when Solomon comes along and he starts talking about Psalm 127, he, he uses an illustration that is actually a military language. It is a battle language. And I absolutely, absolutely love it. In the same way that my brother and I would make these arrows, these bows, and we would sharpen them so that they would achieve the purpose that we had designed for it. I want to suggest to you that in Psalm 127, and then of course, obviously in, in Deuteronomy 6, that we're going to read in a little bit as well, we have this picture of what it means to parent people according to the scriptures, what it means to parent people, uh, parent our children with the gospel in mind, to launch them into the world around them. I'll say it this way, children are arrows to be sharpened and launched, not ornaments to be kept dull and shelved. You hear that? Children are arrows to be sharpened and launched, not ornaments to be kept dull and shelved. And I think this is really important. And I think the reason that it's important is because if we don't understand that, then it's going to impact our parenting. And it ultimately will impact our kids and then, of course, grandkids. See, if we don't understand this, I, I really believe that we fall into a trap of offering some moralistic living instead of gospel living. Here's what I mean. How many of you can remember Veggie Tales? I remember um, when my kids were younger, Veggie Tales was a really big thing. Phil Fisher, the creator of Veggie Tales, um, was looking back. He was in an interview and he was looking back on the impact of Veggie Tales and and VeggieTales was going under, his company was going bankrupt, he had to ultimately sell the company. And, and, and he was looking back on it during this interview, and, and the thing that he regretted most was not the finances or the leadership stuff, it was VeggieTales itself. He says it this way, I took back, I look back at the previous 10 years and realized that I had spent 10 years trying to convince kids, listen to this, trying to convince kids to behave Christianly without actually teaching them Christianity. Think about that for a second. Trying to help kids behave Christianly without teaching them Christianity. And that was pretty serious conviction, he says. You can say, hey kids, be more forgiving because the Bible said so. Or, hey kids, be more kind because the Bible said so. But that isn't Christianity. That's morality. This is what he's saying. Vischer is talking about this idea of, of what he was teaching. He was teaching people to live right. Don't lie, don't steal, don't, don't swear, don't, don't be inappropriate, right? Like all the don'ts that we often teach kids, don't touch that, you know? Um, instead of teaching what the Christian faith really means, what is our why behind the things that we do? And so when we equate the gospel with living a good life, we actually remove Jesus from the picture. And, and when we remove Jesus to the, from the picture, we actually don't become any better than Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees were really big on teaching people how to live right. Man, I just don't want to be a Pharisee. I have no interest in that. Like, I want my kids to fully grasp what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. That adventure that comes with that, that excitement that comes with that. And, and I don't want them to just live right. I want them to live godly. I want them to live with purpose and with intention and, and with the gospel as, as the motivation behind them. When we shift our focus from God's grace onto our own performance, when we're talking about, you know, being resting in God's grace or, or performing rightly, this is the thing that kind of troubled Fisher and what he had been teaching kids. 
But I really think it's easy to fall into that trap of just teaching them right things instead of introducing to the righteous one. The result, I think, actually, is that our children won't really actually understand the gospel. I mean, just think of it as adults. When did you, and at what point in life, did you actually learn what the gospel message was and the implications of the gospel message? You know, were you a little bit older? Or were you, you know, like, what, what did it look like? Were you, were you doing all the right things because you were told that this is what we do and never really being told the why behind it? And, and, and how are we parenting? Are we parenting with our why or our what? The why is the gospel. It's, it's, it's because of who Jesus is. It's because of, uh, of his role in our life and that he, he sends us as a people. And the what is... Well, it's the what we do in response to. Uh, the second thing, not only is it that we will teach a sense of morality instead of the gospel sense of living, I actually believe that we're going to teach from a defensive mindset rather than an offensive mindset. Here's what I mean. Uh, we, we tend to, in, within our Christian circles, view the world as this big, bad monster. And don't get me wrong, the scripture speaks of the world in, in, in certainly not really great terms, right? Um, the world this or the world that. And, but we tend to view it as this big bad monster that's just out to get us. And so when it comes to our children, and certainly at, at, at young ages, rightly so, we become very protective, right? And in becoming protective, we want to make sure that these outside influences are not coming into our kids' lives in order to produce things of the world rather than the things of God. That makes total sense as they're younger. But we fall into this trap of continually trying to protect our kids from the world. And, and so we are offered this dull arrowhead that we keep dull. We don't sharpen it. You see, thinking uh, of, of raising our kids from an offensive perspective, which I believe is a gospel uh, perspective because we're, we're a sent people, it means that as they're younger, we protect them, but as they grow older, we begin to just shift. And so defensive parenting makes us shelter our children away from the claws of the world rather than launch them to strike at the heart of the world. Right, and so we're, we're so worried about the claws that we forget about the heart, and what we're supposed to do is launch our arrows, launch our kids, our, those that we've been pouring into at the heart of the world to be able to impact people for the sake of the gospel. And so I actually believe that it's important for us to understand the key portion of the passage from Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from Him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Children are born to, in one's youth. Think about that like arrows in the hands of a warrior. That's what's talking about our children. So you, as a parent, are a warrior. Your children are the arrows. And in order to impact the world the way we're supposed to, we need to launch those arrows. And so I believe, actually, from Psalm 127 and from Deuteronomy chapter 6, it gives us a bit of a framework of, of I, I think, a healthy pattern for parenting. Here's what I mean. Psalm 127, starting with verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builder labors in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. And so what we learn from this, is Psalm 127, verse 1 and 2, is that we're to focus on Him. Our attention is to be on Him, right? Like unless the Lord builds a house. And so we've got to be looking to Him constantly. Our eyes are up. Our, our direction comes from Him. And He's the one building the house. And so the beauty behind that is that as we focus on Him and we surrender all these things to Him because He's the one building the house, there's a greater sense of security. Here's why. 
in life, the moment you become a parent, okay, for those of you who, who you're living at home right now, maybe the teens that were checking in from last week, for those of you who your parents are still having a very significant influential role in your life, here's what you need to know. We are scared spitless <laughs> because we don't actually know 100% what we're doing. I've said to people before, parenting is an experiment because every kid is different and there's all different kinds of, of ideas and, and, and things that you encounter that you don't totally know what to do with. And so then you do your best with what you have in front of you as you parent. And so we become insecure. I had, and I'll confess this, I, a couple of weeks back, I had a bit of an anxiety attack. Never had one before in my life. I woke up in the morning. Uh, it was about 3.30 in the morning, and I woke up. My heart was pounding. It was racing like crazy. My brain would not shut off, and I woke up from my sleep to the fear. I was failing as a parent. It was my fear. And I know out there, the, those of you who are checking this out, and those of you who, even if you've got adult children, you know it. We're afraid to fail as parents. And we often feel like we're not doing it well. And I actually believe that, that if it's solely rested on our shoulders, I think we would wear that fear even more. Unless the Lord builds a house. You know what that does for us? It doesn't remove our responsibility. But what it does do is offer us a security. You see, because as we look to him, and we get our guidance from him, and we lean into him, and we surrender all of it to him, it's a better way forward. And not only that, that as we focus on him, we're told in Deuteronomy that, that um, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, right? Like the Lord is one. And so again, it's this idea that he is preeminent. He is the one. He is God. And, and like our entire being needs to depend on him as parents. So let me offer it this way, saying it this way. If you want to talk about what it means for us to be parents and, and, and sort of a, a model that we see within Scripture, parents need to make the Lord primary, not because of what we get from him, but because of who he is and in him, we find security and rest. And so you could say that that first point would be stare at God. Stare at him. Keep your eyes fixed. Like, <laughs> I laugh at this all the time. Um, staring, I think, is an important way to say it. Because when you stare, there's a curiosity. When you stare, it's intent. When you stare, it's observable. Uh, because others can see what you're doing. It reminds me of when Janet and I drive in Winnipeg. And the first time we were in Osborne Village, I kid you not, we're driving along and Janet's eyes are glued outside of the passenger side window, staring at these, this pr potentially youth gang, <laughs> you know, like with, with all the, at the time it was really funny because uh, she had never seen people dress the way they were dressed and look the way that they looked like with the giant gauges and the mohawks and the leather and the chains and i mean this is not typical winkler attire and so she was staring and staring i want you to be like that with god stare stare as though you are looking at something unique and strange like you've never seen it before because that is actually who god is he is unique he is strange from the perspective that there is none other like him. So he is not normal. He is the strange. And that is good. Because he's not like us. Stare. Because as you do, you'll read and you'll see more about how he interacts with his children. And then you model that. Stare at God. The second point I would share with you would be this. Sharpen your children. Remember that the language here is a language, especially in Psalm 127, the language here is that of, of children being arrows. It is the language of this military language that, that, that the Lord offers our children to us as these precious gifts. But as such, we, we need to be battle ready with them. And so share, sharpen your children. Psalm 127, verse 3 and 4. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The offspring are a reward from him like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. 
And one of the ways we do that, when we talk about sharpening, right? Because arrows need to be sharpened in order to be useful. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 7 and 9 says it this way. Impress them, talking about the commandments, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home or when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I mean, that's just kind of all encompassing, right? So every aspect of your being, all of it, acknowledge the Lord. Equip your kids in the knowledge of the Lord. Children are a gift from God and we're supposed to, uh, we are to see our children as needing to be sharpened and launched. Sharpened and launched. They are weapons in the world to an degree. They're world changers. That child that maybe you just brought home last week from the hospital, that child is a world changer. That is a life-changing child. The one that you are raising through those toddler years right now that won't let you sleep, that's yelling, mommy, 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 daddy, 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 I pooped, is going to change someone's life. The one who's going through those preaching years who thinks that you know nothing about the world around you. You're going to change things. The one that is graduating high school, getting launched over into university age, they're going to change things. And the extent to which they are equipped to be world changers is dependent on how we parent them towards Jesus. We sharpen them. We sharpen them. Instruct in the words of God. It should be daily. We should be acknowledging God as a way of life because He sustains us in every part of our conversations. And then lastly, I would say this, that we... I was trying to figure out another S to say. I mean, it sounds really bad to say, shoot your kids. Send them. Launch them. Send your warriors. Psalm 127 Verse 5, blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. Talking about children, uh, talking about the arrows in their quiver, but specifically it's about children. They will not be put to shame when they are contend with their opponents in the courts. And, and the picture here is that there is this, this parent, this dad who's in the courts and he's dealing with his enemies and he doesn't have to be ashamed because of his kids. You see, because kids are our legacy in those days. They're your heritage. If the kids were doing well, it meant you did well. So any accusation that would come towards that parent because those kids were doing really well, because those kids were activated, launched, they were excelling in the Lord. They were his defense. There wasn't much that he had to say for himself. I want to suggest to you that when we send the warriors out, these children, there's a gospel legacy. The parents will see the gospel alive in their kids. They'll see it alive in their kids. I remember Theron was seven years old. My son Theron, he's now 20, turning 20. He was seven years old, and it was the first time I had taken him out to deliver Christmas hampers. And we'd go up to this person's door, and we knock on the door, and we say, hey, we're here with Christmas cheer board. We'd like to be able to deliver you a hamper. And then Theron just piped up, little guy from here, and he just kind of steps in front of me and he says, because Jesus loves you. And he should have saw the smile on this lady's face as we had the opportunity to bring in this hamper and Theron did his best to drag a sack of potatoes, but it, was, it weighed as much as he did. Um, it was awesome. A few years later, uh, we had the opportunity to continue doing this every year. It's kind of how we start Christmas. Um, we went to this one home, and, and, and so as we go, and Theron's older, I think he would have been probably 15, 16 years old at the time. And he got to see the reaction of the children after having received the hamper. And he saw that expressing the love of Jesus to people had a dramatic impact, and it moved him. And then, of course, as a dad, it moved me. And he said, this is why we do this. We need, need to make sure that our kids understand what the gospel actually is and what the implications of the gospel is. We don't just raise our kids with morals. 
You know, we don't we don't say forgive because the Bible says so. No, we say forgive. And here's why we forgive. We forgive because we want to be just like Jesus. And here's what you need to know. Forgiveness, ultimate forgiveness from Jesus looked like this. He came from heaven to earth in the form of a baby. Grew up, he lived a sinless life. He died for the sins of mankind, rose again three days later so that we could be in right standing with him, right standing with the Father. And, and, and he did this, and then he says, you reach out to me, I forgive you. Done. So we forgive, yes, because the Bible says so. But how the Bible talks about it matters. We forgive because Jesus forgives. We live in freedom because Jesus offers us freedom, but we're not to use our freedom to indulge the evil desires of the world. Okay, so then what do we then do? How do we then live? Well, we live like Jesus lived. Jesus didn't live a boring life. Jesus didn't, like he just wasn't bored. And, and I can't fathom the idea of a boring Christianity. We raise our kids in the gospel. And I haven't done this perfectly. I wish I could say I did, but I haven't. I'm still working on it, and I'm still trying to figure it out because I'm still working it out even in my own life with the implications of the gospel in my own life, and how does that then play out in the lives of others? Like, so because of the gospel message, everybody's equal. Because of the gospel message, we recognize that every single person on the planet is sick in need of a doctor. Every single person on the planet is lost and needs to be found. Every single person on the planet is imperfect. But the gospel, because of Christ's righteousness given to us, makes us right in the eyes of the Father. We're all on the same playing field. And so I need to treat everyone like we're on the same playing field because of the gospel. Gospel legacy, parents, we need to see the gospel alive in our kids, regardless of their age. So if staring at God brings security for us as parents, if staring at God gives us a sense of, I get it, I don't have it all together, but I know that he does, and so I want to do things his way, how much are you staring at God right now? Like, how much does he have your focus? Or is your focus on, I get up, I go to work, I come home, I eat, I sit with my family for a little bit, I go to bed, and tomorrow I get up. Is that the pattern of life? How much are you staring at God? Like, when's the last time you, you picked up your Bible? And, and, and I get it, like, not all of us like to read, but when is the last time you picked up your Bible and you just said, I'm just going to read one chapter? Like, just one chapter a day. When's the last time you picked it up? See, I don't believe you can stare at God, have your eyes focused on Him if you're not in His Word because it's in His Word that tells you about Him. Or maybe just listen to an audio Bible. But when is the last time you were focused on Him? How are you doing with that? If... Children are a gift that need instructing, then how intentional are we being about this gospel instructing? Like, how intentional are we being? Are we telling our kids, don't do this because we want you to be good? Or are we saying, hey, we want you to be like Jesus, and so because we want to be like Jesus, these are the things we do and these are the things we avoid? What are we teaching? Are we teaching moralism? Or are we teaching people to move in the direction of becoming more and more like Jesus? And if children are like arrows that need to be launched, how, how willing are we to let go of that bowstring? I know so many people that are afraid for their kids because the big bad monster of the world with its ugly claws is out to get them. Get that. I do, and it's part of me that's protective over my kids too. Got to let go of that bowstring. We got to. We got to trust that God has a work for them that he created from the beginning of time for them to do, as it tells us in Ephesians. We got to trust that the Lord God is in fact God, and that if he is in fact God, then we can trust our kids to him. 
And we've got to trust that they are capable of being able to take everything that we have instructed them in, sharpen them in along the way, into the world with them. Are we willing to let go of the bowstring? So if you're a kid and you're hearing this, you're checking this out and you're, and you're like, yeah, mom and dad, you got to let go of the bowstring. Here's, here's what I want you to hear. Um, go to your parents for the instruction. Don't just ask your parents to let you go. Don't just ask them, like we talked about last week, to not look down on you because of your youth, but in your youth. Be an example in your purity, right? And all these different kinds of things. But learn how to do those things. Go to your parents and say, teach me about the gospel. What are the implications of the gospel? How am I to interact with the world around me because of the gospel? Tell me what it is. Don't just tell me what to do. Crave it. Learn. Don't ask to be launched don't demand it. Prepare for it. So here's what I think we should do this week. Take time this week as a parent to read Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. And also read Psalm 127. And then in doing so, I want you to commit yourself, in terms of the staring at God part, commit yourself to time with Jesus to ensure that he's actually number one in your life. So just start with reading a passage of scripture a day. That's it. That's all I want you to read a passage of scripture a day and try that. Commit yourself to having conversations with your kids about what the gospel is and the implications of it. Do that. Like, don't just tell them what, tell them why. And help your child launch towards gospel-centered opportunity. How about this? Um, I loved our, our last set of conversations with our teens and, and how they desire to be connected and we desire for them to be connected and it's just this awesome place of wanting to connect. Help your kid connect. Help them. Help them figure out where, where their space is to connect with the adult world. Enter their space. Let them enter your space. But let's figure it out together. But help launch your kid into a gospel-centered opportunity so that they can see that God can use them powerfully like a mighty sharpened arrow because that's what he calls them. He calls them arrows. And if we move forward in this, we will parent our children towards their identity and towards their freedom in Christ rather than simply subjective moralistic living. We will disciple our kids to be confident in the gospel and we will build a strong faith foundation for our children. One that we don't have to worry about whether or not they'll turn from it when they're older because they have a proper concept of it now. And so we move in that direction. And why? Because children are arrows to be sharpened and launched, not ornaments to be kept dull and shelved. God has a plan for your kids. And it's not divorced from you. You're part of that plan. So look to him, sharpen your kids, and launch them. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Jesus, that as we're dealing with this concept, Lord, that you will show us, that you'll bring people into our lives to help us figure out some of the, the more practical ways that this thing can flesh out. But Jesus, would you help us to be a people as parents who will focus on you so that we will know how to sharpen our kids so that we can launch them into the world that you have prepared a way for them in. May we trust you more. Lord, be with all those who are kids and, 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 and their desire to grow and to learn and to be launched. Jesus, that they will have such a craving to become more and more like you, this adventurer in life who brings wholeness to you, who brings that good news, that gospel message to the world around them so that others can also live freely in you. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us for church today. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as the gospel relates to parenting. To listen to the full conversation, head over to our YouTube channel. Over there, you'll also find all the rest of the conversations that we've had in this series. If you would like to give to Pathway Community Church today, 
Here's a couple ways that you can do that. You can pay with PayPal, you can do an online payment, or you can set up automatic withdrawals or send an e-transfer. For this information and any other assistance, please visit pathwaycc.net slash give. Have a fantastic Sunday.